thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Kwame Owino from the Institute of Economic Affairs, and I'm very conscious of the fact that from 4 o'clock or thereabouts, we're supposed to start our networking. Um, so, and the previous presentation has been fairly, fairly comprehensive, so I'll try and spend 15 minutes at most uh, to speak about a few things. But let me remind you that my, I speak about, the things I'll speak about are informed by the fact that I work in a think tank. And what does a think tank do? The Institute of Economic Affairs carries out research on public affairs. And we use the result of that uh, research that we carry out, dispassionate research that we carry out, to have conversations with professionals like yourselves, but at the same time for public education. And once in a while, we have opportunity to meet with decision makers in parliament, the executive branches, and we discuss that with them and give them feasible policy alternatives. So that's the first. The second thing is that uh, uh, we are practicing economists in the sense that our work is research on a day-to-day -day basis and surfacing conversations. Now, the way we think about resilience, it was partly explained, but that's what I'll go back to again, is this. That resilience is basically that, uh, that ability of a system to recover when it faces a shock or a mishap. Um, and for that reason then, we can talk about resilience in three ways. We can talk about resilience at the national level. We can talk about resi resilience at farm level, which is what would be perhaps the, the, the direct responsibility of managers in this, in this, or professionals in this institution, I mean in this uh, assembly. And you could also talk about resilience at the household level. Um, so all those things um, mean, I mean, resilience would be basically the ability to bounce back from a shock. And it depends. There are micro levels, and of course, there's the big level at the national level. Our subject, however, is to talk about the ability, I mean, uh, resilience and collaborative approaches to economic resilience, um, uh, focusing on international cooperation. I'd also want to say this before I go down to my points very, very quickly, is that the way students of economics look at economies, sometimes I hear Kenyans or some people say, our economy or the economy, uh, it's something that is a fault of economists because we haven't sufficiently educated people that the economy is not a thing. It's not a physical thing like this desk. It is the result, it is a system because it's the result of independent decisions made at all those three levels that I've talked about. From households making decisions about what they purchase and what not to, what they save and what not to, farms making decisions about who they hire and who they do not, and making decisions about when to expand and whether to buy a machine or to buy things like that, and government making decisions about who to tax and at the same time who to pay and who, how many people to employ and where to spend that money. You get that? So it's systems. And, and I think people who work in farms and do strategy understand things as systems. So there's feedback on one side. I mean, there's an input here that de generates a, a feedback on the other side and all those things go back uh, throughout it. So that's why we think of it as a system. So resilience thinking is about how restore that uh, system at the shock that the system has suffered to a level that allows for stability, but also if growth was taking place for that growth to be restored. If you think about it in, the, in, 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 in that way, I'll come down to what are some of the biggest uh, threats to, or rather what are the, some of the things that create the shocks and then we'll talk about how we think international cooperation should lead with them. So at the macro level today, at the macro level today, remember, one of the biggest shocks in the more recent years has been the pandemic, COVID, which was completely unanticipated, uh, though it should not have been, but it was unanticipated. And one of the things that it did is obviously it led us to all, Kenyans call it lockdown, but it was, we didn't have a lockdown in Kenya, really. We had curfews, we had stayed in place. But globally, the first thing that happened was People closed up, lives were in danger. In Kenya, the biggest public service system, which is a school system, 16 million kids wake up every day and go to a school, suddenly they're not going to school. Uh, the right decision to prevent uh, the possibility of contagion. Transport systems were limited to specific times. We all had to be, so you can see how all those things, generating from a global shock, came all the way back, reverberated through to government, government making certain decisions, into schools, and all the way back to farms, and then to, to to, to households. So that was one, one specific one. And, 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 and in point, as an economist, the only thing we can tell you, and I think that would be valid for house, national, and even as a farm, is the better the conditions in which a system, uh, or rather in which 
an entity, whether the country, whether the household, or whether the individual or farm is, the more likely you are to survive a shock. The more likely you are to survive a shock because you have resources, you can make adjustments, and that. In Kenya's case, as you remember, COVID could not have come at a worse time because one of the first things that happened when COVID came in, uh, the pandemic, was farms were closed, as we know. I think this place was closed as well because tourism was suspended, numbers were really low, and some hotels had to close and send people in. That shock reverberated all the way back to households, affected government's income, and revenues came out. And government had a big, big, big uh, decision to make about whether to extend cash, I mean, whether to extend uh, uh, expenditures at a time when the revenues were not coming, and the first thing that, then that, that affected was government revenues actually started to drop. Uh, and yet government needed to pay cash. And then comes international cooperation. So the government of Kenya first went into a program the IMF around about uh, 2020, I think either July or some, a little later in the second half of the year, which provided float for the government of Kenya based on the fact that institutions such as the IMF and all those exist to help countries weather financial and systemic shocks. So here again, all I'm trying to show is international cooperation on the basis of a multilateral system allowed the government of Kenya to, uh, uh, to do a little better than it would have done absent that institutional arrangement. So that's, that's one. Today, I think one of the macro level things today is that you remember the effects of COVID have just worn out. Last year, there's a big burst of inflation throughout the world, and we saw it in Kenya as well. Uh, Kenya's courses were a little different, but in other parts of the world, it could have been the fact that many countries spent a lot of money to try and keep uh, economies or households working by sending money to households. There was government support in, in the US, in the UK, and in other countries. Over time, that built into in, in inflation. And obviously, there was inflation pressure, pressures last year, as you, as you all can remember. There was also recovery because due to COVID, some supply, or rather global value chains and value chains were affected because some places were closed, there was no shipping and all that. So as all that survive, uh, revival came about, there's a global demand for many more things. That can also be a shock. Shocks are not always negative. They can also be on the other side and in, in themselves obviously cause quite a bit of uh, uh, turbulence um, um, in, in that way. Now, I think at the end of the year, it was clear towards the end of the year, last year, that uh, I think the global inflation shocks were abating. And we, see, we saw it in Kenya as well, part of it was because of rains. And last year, Kenya had uh, almost a full year of rain after five years, six years actually, consecutive years of suboptimal rainfall. So again, for Kenya's case, agricultural shocks tend to reverberate throughout the economy because most, of, most Kenyans work in farms and they work in farming. So any shock on agricultural harvests affect food prices almost immediately. Uh, and that, of course, works its way up. It affects employment as well. It squeezes uh, household incomes. So that's, that's, that's one. Now, the biggest shock this year that is uh, expected is basically, I think, a slowdown in the Chinese economy is expected. The Chinese economy has been big. It's large, actually. And not only because it's large, it depends quite a lot. Rather, other economies depend on the vibrancy of the Chinese economy to continue to operate, whether as a supplier or a demand side for all those global goods and services that are produced and, and, and pushed around the world. So the IMF this year has adjusted global growth forecast from about 4.5%, I think, to about 3.9 or about 4, uh, meaning that there's a global economy will be 10% smaller than was anticipated, or rather will grow at a 10% lower rate than was anticipated earlier uh, in the year. So that in itself has led to adjustments, including in Kenya, where the growth forecast was, I think, about 5.8. It's now been adjusted to just, I mean, 5.7. It's just now been adjusted to slightly between 4.9 to 5.1. So again, a shock, something happened everywhere, coming back down here, and requires adjustments from the receiving end. So that's basically it. I'll come now to households. Um, now, protecting incomes is one of the ways. Remember, most households in Kenya, as I said, are, most houses in Kenya, as I said, are dependent on agriculture. Or the primary source of incomes for many households in Kenya is agriculture. So you know that there are 14 million 
households according to the last census, they'd be about, they'd be closer to 15, 15.5 million today, or maybe just shy of 15 million today. Uh, the affordable housing notwithstanding, they're 15 million houses. Um, so those 15 million houses have people who work on farms, such as what we see. This is the rainy season, so obviously uh, they're working back there. So that tells you that vulnerability at the household level comes entirely from employment shocks or agriculture shocks, which then come to employment shocks and who has income. So at that point, what you need to protect is household incomes. And as you can see, there is no direct channel between household shocks and global or international cooperation, in, in a manner of speaking, because houses don't have a, a direct commitment, though there might be, <laughs> uh, which might be in the form of labor. Uh, many Kenyan households depend quite a bit on remittances from relatives who work in other parts of the world. So whenever their income is affected, it works back here, but obviously by setting that, that can provide a buffer to prevent huge consumption shocks that could happen in, in households. I think as you can tell with these floods as well, right, we can tell. Uh, a weather shock is a big, big one for Kenya. <laughs> uh, international cooperation could help with global institutions that help in the construction of infrastructure. It's very, very clear today, whatever else any Kenyan might think about, that we need to reconsider, not just in urban areas, throughout the country. As we had before, uh, climate shocks and weather shocks are not anymore a question of imagination and debate. They are here. And because they are here, as you've told, I read today early in the morning and the newspapers, somebody put together numbers suggesting that about 40 people have died in the last four weeks alone. Uh, entirely related to the fact of these sudden floods and, the, and, and, and rainfalls. And so all of us know we welcome rainfall because obviously it's useful for, that, for, for food production, which is important in these countries because I've talked about the employment effect. But at the same time, this shock has generated uh, not only damage to property, but lives have been lost so far. I hope that's the last of it. But as you see floods going up there, um, it's clear to us that yes, uh, weather shocks related to climate changes, very abrupt climate changes like we do, have, has overwhelmed the, the, the flood management systems, not just in the city of Nairobi, uh, we see it a little bit here, earlier in the week, and obviously in other parts of the world. And it's not just damaging incomes, damaging households, leading to loss of lives, but it's also damaging property and affecting business performance as well. It is not clear that there's a direct link, but a global cooperation would be useful because this is where perhaps global investments could be harnessed to construct a better drainage system for Nairobi, to construct better drainage system generally, to clear uh, sea, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, You've seen the pathetic pictures, I mean, the, the, the sorry pictures from Athi River. The river has reclaimed its course and is running through people's houses and incomes. Uh, obviously, part of that could be uh, ameliorated if there's investment, I mean, there's uh, insurance. It's not clear that all those places were insured, nor is it clear that insurance companies would actually accept that because some of those were in really, really recognized floodplains, but also uh, uh, ri river courses. So it will be very, very difficult for, for us to do that. But that, that shock is real. And so resilience will depend on the performance of the financial system on one side, whether people can regain jobs and government uh, uh, ability to respond. Now, so that employment focus is, a, is an essential one. You see, fiscal and monetary policy uh, should anticipate the unknown to allow for quick responses. Uh, fiscal and monetary policy is basically how government responds through taxes and its expenditures. It's clear uh, that right now there's a lot of repair work that's going to be done in Nairobi and other parts of the world. I think in Nairobi, in, in, I mean, other parts of uh, this country, including in Mombasa as well, just dealing with drainage. If anything, this shock has reminded us that the drainage systems have been completely abandoned or not. They're too small for, 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 for purpose, and right now they need to be expanded quite a bit. So that's an investment opportunity. Resources would have to be harnessed. Uh, some cooperation could happen because there are global institutions that have done fantastic things for, for city growth and demography, I mean, to, to account for changes in demography. So international cooperation could be in various forms. It could be multilateral, it could be bilateral. And I think it's, a, it's the position of governments to actually think what is required. It's technical expertise which comes globally. It can also be financial and intellectual resources which are, which are necessary to respond to, to these kind of shocks. Uh, so, as I conclude, all, I, all I'm trying to say is that for farms, uh, farms and households are intermediaries. They are not directly connected to global international cooperation, even where it is possible that some farms receive investments from abroad and some 
incomes, I mean, some uh, uh, households also receive remittances of some income. But the ri direct connection to global international cooperation tends to be, not exclusively, but tends to be through uh, government, uh, governments, which has partners bilaterally, multilaterally. Farms do have partners as a form of investments or any kind of joint ventures that too. But households are the most vulnerable here because households don't have that direct connect and therefore rely on the government's ability to provide what are called public goods. Those public goods are stuff such as what? Uh, flood control, energy, safety features that ensure that people's property is protected. But also finally, I think it's also when we have a shock such as what we see, resilience requires that people be supported in the rehabilitation phase. Um, I think as you can see floods here for instance, I overstate that because it's the most <laughs> salient, but basically as, as what you can see is that it would be good, or rather government comes in to provide private goods, which is government support in very direct ways to provide people with an opportunity to be rehabilitated to recover. So that's again part of ensuring resilience. What it's telling you is that resilience at farm, household and national level is dependent on what kind of space uh, and what the place the, the, the standing of the economy, the household at the farm was prior to the shock, telling us that good and sound financial management at households, farm resource management at households at farm and national level is one of the ways in which you ensure that shocks uh, do not uh, devastate uh, because it ensures that, uh, that, uh, that uh, recovery takes place quickly. Uh, farms also uh, do undertake some things which is basically to diversify global value chains. You know that supply chains globally have been distributed. And many things, that's both a source of shocks, but it's also actually a resilience. Because if one place is affected, the ability to divert, and it doesn't affect the entire production process. We saw that uh, out there with the, with the uh, during COVID, and obviously in the new, uh, um, uh, in the post-COVID recovery phase. So as I conclude, this is what I'd like to say. It's clear to me that resilience is an essential feature of a society to continue its growth path and survive. Why? Because growth does not take place on a straight line. You respond to shocks, and the response to shocks should make a system even stronger, because having absorbed that strong, that, 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 that shock, you're prepared for it. That's one. Two, anticipatory effects, which is basically you know whether they're good times or not. I think there's one thing to anticipate, which is when a shock comes, which you can anticipate or not, the ability to have buffers and the space to be able to respond. Basically, resilience is just engineering language. It came from engineering. And engineers know that the resilience is, you know how much a bridge can take based on the construction effects, but you then decide that, look, let's provide some space on the side, 15% resilience, which allows for that uh, shock to be taken without the entire edifice collapsing. So the resilience is about giving a bouncing uh, capacity for that. But it all, all depends on the health of the system to begin with. And the health of the system is in turn dependent on the state of the farms, the state of the households, and uh, the policy posture of the government. So thank you very much.